I think uh, if I can have your attention, I think we're going to get started. Thank you for coming to uh, our last Focus Day activity. Um, how artists do work with Jen Lethbridge, Van Wyne, Sean Tishmer, and Brent Klein. Um, but it's not our last Focus activity for the week. Tomorrow night in the RCF at the same time, uh, Dr. Jeff Bilbro will be giving a talk uh, called uh, Imagining Healthy Work, Why We All Must Become Monks. Um, so I'd hope you would consider attending Dr. Bilbro's talk at 7 p.m. tomorrow. And if you don't get enough of Brent Klein tonight, he'll be giving the Community of Learners lecture at 10 a.m. on Friday morning, which I believe is in this very location. Um, and it's something about saving your souls, don't be a leader, or something like that. Um, and then finally, uh, Friday evening, also here in White Auditorium at 7 p.m., uh, Paul Patton will be doing a, uh, a performance of Woodrow Wilson, and I don't remember the title entirely, but accompanied by uh, Professor Heidenberg on the piano, uh, performing music written by Dr. Bruce Brown. So, uh, still uh, three more focus event opportunities if you have not achieved all the extra credit you can achieve by attending focus activities or still have some requirements to fulfill. Um, or if you just want to uh, attend more academic activities. So, thank you uh, for coming this evening. And with that, I'll turn it over to our panelists. Because you can already tell what happens if I mess up. All my four pennies. 
things go away. And then you wouldn't get to see what comes next. <laughs> series would have changed more of your minds. But this is good. It works to my own punchline very much better. Now, how many of you, so now the rest of you must raise your hand. The rest of you, please raise your hands, would prefer a life of work. So you can see, it is highly overwhelming for play over work. Now, I have another set of questions. Again, there are two answers. You must choose one of them. No abstentions. All right? This is not graded. I don't think the video camera is aimed at you, only at me. All right? So... How many of you would prefer to not produce something of value with your life? Or the opposite, how many of you would prefer to produce something of value with your life? All right, so first, how many of you would purposely rather not produce anything of quality or value with your life? Please raise your hand. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> now, how many of you would rather produce something of quality or value with your life, please raise your hand. Now, this is quite a dichotomy, right? Because play is doing things without an objective. No purpose, which means that the majority of that raise their hand saying I would rather have a life of play, means you should have raised your hands for the other one. It's quite interesting, isn't it? I, I always thought that was, it's, a, it's a good way to, you ask the same question two different ways and you get drastically different answers. I always thought it was good food for thought. But now, we're going to move on. It's, I only have three slides, so don't be worried. All right? <laughs> this was the first one, and here's the second one. Right? Play. All right, so it's creative and not goal-oriented. Right? So hence, if it's not goal-oriented, then... I mean, you could get lucky and produce something of value, but that's not what you're trying to do anyway, right? It's play. All right now, instrumental music, instrument, right? Instrumental music, my forte, if you will, in Italian, which is not English, because then it's fort, but that's another, another bad joke, all right? <laughs> in English, we call it playing the saxophone, playing music, playing the gig, right? But as I demonstrated, we would most consider it much more work in order to, to produce things of higher quality than that. Now, my favorite definition of work and play is antithetical to what you really do, right? Because if I didn't do hours and hours of not only tiny little things of what I showed you, right, but also you have to have thousands of hours working on embouchure, just how you move your lips. Right, so those of you that are in theater or oration, right, or communications, you appreciate practicing moving your lips. It's, it's a fun activity. At first. <laughs> Air manipulation. Tongue position. Where should my tongue be? Because again, it's different than talking because you're blowing into a saxophone or some other instrument. Right? Timbre. How do I really want to sound? Gaining familiarity with your equipment. And note the reed, which is one of our fickle friends. 
changes by humidity and pressure and temperature. Oh, joy. <laughs> then there are many hours of transcriptions, practicing patterns, learning theory, practicing arpeggiations, finding guiding tones in the harmonic progressions. And then on top of that technical work comes thousands of hours of listening to different jazz musicians to find out the ones that you actually want to sound like. Then once you find the ones you would like to sound like, you must listen to them over and over and over again to get it ingrained in yourself and listen to the people that they listen to because the people that they listen to form them, right? Which again, has a lot of fun joy to it, right? There are lots of things we do, hopefully everything we can do joyfully. But some things are more monotonous than others, right? Now for God, all actions are play. Why? Because God doesn't need to work to become better because God is already the best. Or whatever superlative you wish to place in there, right? I'm all for synonyms, right? Best wasn't your favorite one, you could fill you in your own. Now, unfortunately, we are fallen creatures, correct? Right? So we need work to overcome our fallen nature in order to produce things of quality for which God can do without effort, right? No human can create the world as we know it on their first try or any equivalent, anywhere close, right? I mean, if we could, we wouldn't try flying to Mars, we'd just make another Earth. But even in science fiction, we don't talk that crazy, right? That would be out there. Right, so therefore, work is, is very important for that. And now we're already to my third slide. So those of you that weren't interested in my speech, you can rest assured, I'm almost done. <laughs> and in case you couldn't figure out, work, right, the topic of the entire thing. Now Ron Capico, he's constantly, our, our, our chaplain, is giving out great reminders and advice for how to live a life as, a, as an example of Christ. I think it was last year when he handed out these cards, right? And along with the fruits of the Spirit, oh, I didn't have them in the right order, which is one of my favorites. Another one is one that was on the keynote lecture today, and we didn't even talk in pre-plan. We didn't match outfits either. Now, he had a nice picture of, I believe it was Notre Dame Cathedral, remember with the gargoyles? Whereas in Ron Capico chose a little more American, a uh, carpenter on a roof, right? So it says goodness, or I like to think greatness, right? Or excellence, right? The godly standard by which we do everything we do, right? And then there's Colossians, right? Is the scripture passage, right? That says, do your work with all your heart as unto the Lord rather than to men. Maybe it's because I'm a Methodist, but I think methodical practice is one of the best ways to fulfill godly standards. Now here's my important disclaimer, all right? Prayer and discernment of God's will is vital for a life to emulate Christ. If I want to go over there and I run as hard as I can over here, I end up worse off than I started had I just sat there and done nothing, right? I could run as methodically as possible in that direction, and I can guarantee you I will not make it around the world and end up where I wished to go. I am not that good of a swimmer, nor that good of a runner, nor a climber, or a mover through large and mobile objects like walls. <laughs> it is just not going to happen. So again, methodical actions in order to help overcome our fallen state. But again, God divinely creates. And that's one of our purposes, right? And especially if we're supposed to make earth more like heaven, and God creates, hence earth, right? That's why we're all here. It's a wonderful gift, enjoy. Now, related to my running, I have a little side note. Now, Dr. Klein, he has He's a great person to talk to about the orthodox view of sin and being distanced from God. It's very interesting. I highly recommend it. Of course, coming to listen to him tomorrow is, no, Friday. 
my days, I, my Monday, Wednesday, and Friday just go day to day. I always just say, if it's Wednesday, then tomorrow's Friday, and then Tuesday and Thursday happen to appear, and they are next days as well. That's when you can tell you've been in academia a little too long. Now, back to my original point. I contend that one of our major failings as Christians is not fulfilling that hard work, that methodical hard work that is required to create excellence. Right? The Barna Group has done statistical studies, right? and they wrote about the results in the book Unchristian. And they found that people are going away from the church not because they've never heard the message, and not because they dislike Christ, and not because they find the Christian idea lacking, but rather they find Christians' actions not aligning with Christ's life and teachings. Right? So what does that tell us? I mean, again, the discernment, right? Because you can work really hard, move in the wrong way, and that is worse off than just not doing anything. Right? Hitler was very methodical, and we don't want to repeat any of those errors. But once you discern the direction, you still need to be methodical in order to, to work to achieve that. Now, the good news tells us to rejoice for the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. <laughs> now, this calls into question our American ideal of work and play. Now, we've all heard that your career should be what you love. So then it doesn't seem like work. And I think that is great advice. But no matter what you choose, in order to do it to God's standard of excellence, right, it will require effort and exertion that does not always seem like play. Therefore, I encourage you to prepare yourselves to a godly standard by doing the mundane and repetitive actions that will help you produce good works. And to close up with one of Chaplain Capico's cards, try to do it as joyfully as possible. And now, one of my community colleagues from the art department, Rachel, uh oh, Van Wylen. Van Wylen. Yeah. I should have practiced that as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let me this up here. So that was a good segue because I am talking about community. Um, and the question I want to answer is, do real artists work in isolation or in community? And because I'm a painter, I have the possibility of working mostly in isolation in secluding myself off in a private little studio and really only emerging once in a while to show my work in a gallery. Or for that matter, if I wanted to, I could never even leave to do that. I could just be totally isolated off on my own. Um, but even though that's possible, I don't think it's a good idea. And I don't think that that's how the best artists work. So um, before I talk about community, though, I want to talk about a certain artistic cliche, and you can't see this image really all that well, but that's maybe a good thing because what I wanted to emphasize is the darkness of this image, and it's a little darker on the screen than it is even in real life. Um, but this is, um, this is a painting by Carl Spitzweg, and I think it really nicely illustrates a certain artistic cliche, um, which is that the artist is off by himself, he's this kind of creative person, he's writing these poems, but he's not really um, communicating with anybody else. In fact, if you look off on the left side of this painting, all of his poems are next to the furnace, and that's the only fuel he has to keep his little garret apartment warm, is his burning his own poems. Um, so he's sort of the stereotypical, impoverished, loner genius who's just waiting to be discovered. Um, now to be fair, there's a tiny scrap of truth in this cliche about creative types. It is hard to earn a living in the arts, and many artists do spend some of their working time alone. But the idea that artists are utter, utterly isolated from other people, so much so that they might as well burn their own poems, just isn't true. Um, in fact, G.K. Chesterton would say that this is exactly what is not true of artists. 
So in this quote he says, Yet there's a still, a, still a vast amount of talk about the isolated and incommunicable spirit of the man of genius, about how he has in him things too deep for expression and too subtle to be subject to general criticism. I say that is exactly what is not true of the artist. That is exactly true of the ordinary man who is not an artist. He has subtleties in his soul which he cannot describe. He has secrets of emotion which he can never show to the public. He it is who dies with all his music in him. But it should obviously be the aim of the musician to die with all his music out of him, even if this ideal state of things can seldom be achieved. So in other words, he's saying, if you're a real artist, you are gonna find a way of getting your work out there, even if it's to a small or selective audience, you'll get yourself out there. So this brings me to the question of, um, what about some of the really famous artists who we might think of as fitting the kind of loner genius cliche? Um, and to, in my mind, one of the first artists who comes to my mind when I think of that is Vincent Van Gogh. Um, he's sort of the iconic anti-art establishment loner crazy artist. Um, so doesn't his existence and his success after his own death prove Chesterton wrong? Well, um, in fact, Van Gogh was not as reclusive as we might be tempted to imagine. Believe it or not, one of Van Gogh's goals was to set up something of an artist community in Arles, which is in the southern France. And so, you can see it in this painting. He rented this little house, the Yellow House, and he envisioned it as a studio of the South where all these artists would come together. And he. In one of his brother letters that he wrote to his brother Theo, he said, I wish everybody would come south like me. So this yellow house never really did become a thriving studio with many artists, but after much begging from Vincent, one other artist did come down, and that was Paul Gauguin. So to give you an idea of how much Van Gogh longed to have another artist come and work with him, I'm just gonna read a short portion of another one of his letters to his brother Theo. And while I'm reading this, keep in mind that this was not written originally in English, so the translation's a little wonky, but um, it's not, not Van Gogh's fault. Um, anyway, here's, here's Van Gogh writing to his brother. He says, I'm thinking about Gauguin a lot, and I am sure that in one way or another, whether, whether it is he who comes here or I who go to him, he and I will like practically the same subjects, and I have no doubt that I could work at Pont Aven, which is where Gauguin was living at the time. And on the other hand, I am convinced that he would tremendously like the country down here. If we each live alone, it means living like madmen or criminals, in appearance at any rate, and also a little in reality. Oops, I, I should have pulled up that slide, slide a minute earlier, <laughs> but there's a quote. <laughs> anyway, so obviously Van Gogh saw the potential for things to go south for him um, if he didn't have a community of people around him, and he really did try to surround himself with other artists. Um, now, I'm imagining that many of you are already familiar with Van Gogh's paintings of sunflowers. Um, but what you might not know is that the reason he painted those sunflowers was actually in anticipation of Gauguin's arrival down in Arles. So he wanted to decorate the studio space that they were gonna to share together. And he painted all these beautiful sunflowers to make it pretty for Gauguin. Um, so far from having anything, anything to do with isolation, they're actually about hospitality. Okay. So after Gauguin's arrival, the two artists did work together and they actually did paint a lot of the same scenes just like Van Gogh had hoped. So this painting, Night Cafe, is Van Gogh's version of this all-night tavern in Arles. And he would have painted this like about a month before Gauguin came and joined him. And then later, when Gauguin came, he painted the same tavern, but you can see it's different. You know, they both have their own interpretation of the space. Um, and in his letters to his brother Theo, Van Gogh writes about the dialogue that they were having during this time. Another really kind of interesting quote, he says, Our arguments are terribly electric. We come out of them sometimes with our heads as exhausted as an electric battery after it has run down. And so they fought a little bit, but in a good way. They were able to feed each other's creativity and it was a productive relationship while it lasted. 
Um, now, unfortunately, it did end, and it did end somewhat tumultuously. I don't know how many of you know the story, but um, around this time, Van Gogh was experiencing a, some kind of mental decline, and he cut off his ear, presented the bloody, severed ear to a prostitute. Around that time, Gauguin decided things weren't working out. Um, <laughs> so, it, it, and the relationship was not long-lasting. However, even though it didn't end so well, um, and nevertheless, I do think it's significant that both of them acknowledge their need of working in relationship with other artists. And for the time that it worked, it really was a productive, creative dialogue between the two of them. Um, so that's a story about two 19th century artists. Uh, what about today and what about me? Well, you probably see where this is going. Um, I really do try to seek out communities of other artists for myself, too. Um, and in fact, oops, here is a picture of the artist residency I did last summer. I applied to do this residency through the New York Art Students League because I wanted to be able to work with other artists. Um, and so here we all are, we've just eaten a bunch of Italian food and lasagna and cannoli, so we're all smiling. Um, and we were smiling other times too. But, um, so I want to tell you a little bit about the kind of work I got done during this month. In order to actually get one of these residencies, you have to apply and you have to say what you're going to do. So I wrote in my application that I was going to work on these huge portraits. And when I first got there, I dutifully set to work. I was working on the large portraits. They were going fine. But I, I thought maybe I needed to do something differently. I just wasn't excited about the work. And it was actually through a conversation with one of the other residents that I changed my direction. Um, it was kind of a, it was about a week into the residency and he was my studio mate, so I had gotten to know him a little bit and we were just sitting in the kitchen that was just a shared space, looking out the window. It was in the morning, but it was dark because there was a thunderstorm. I said, you know, I just don't really know what I'm doing. And he said, well, maybe you should go outside and paint a landscape. I was like, no, it's, there's a thunderstorm. Um, but he said, just try it, go out on the porch. So um, I did. I decided to take a shot at it, see what happens. And it actually was the beginning of a kind of interesting new body of work for me. Um, the thing about painting outdoors, especially during a thunderstorm or any other kind of unusual weather event, is that everything's changing rapidly. And so it forces you to paint quickly in a way that you don't have to if you're working in the studio from a still life or from, you know, just a, if you're painting a portrait of somebody who's sitting there because nothing changes. So I was working really, really quickly and after about six hours out on the front porch, I ended up with this. And when I first finished it, I didn't even know how I felt about it because it was different for me. It wasn't what I was used to doing. But I kind of looked at it and I thought, you know, I really enjoyed that. That was an interesting new process for me. And I decided I was going to spend the rest of the residency doing this kind of work, where I would paint rapidly. I would actually go to a different site almost every day. Um, and so I'll show you a few other pieces from that body of work. This one, um, I could only work on from 6 to 8 in the evening because the light in the evening was always changing so rapidly. So I had to paint really fast. I painted over the course of three nights and really could only get a little bit of work done every night. But it was, it was new, and I had to force myself to loosen up a little bit in a way that I hadn't before. Um, here's another one. At this point, I actually drove all the way up to Constitution Marsh, kind of close by um, West Point, and did a painting up there even faster, because they, they won't let you spend that much time out here. So I probably had three and a half, four hours Again, I had to really, really work rapidly, but it was, it was a good process for me. And I was bringing the work back to the residency and getting kind of an interesting response from other artists. Them saying, you know, it doesn't look like what you were doing before, but there's a vitality to it, there's something interesting. At the very least, it's a direction worth pursuing. So it was worth it. I was incredibly grateful for these other relationships with these other artists and that I was able to be influenced by them, have these conversations, and be forced out of what I would ordinarily do. Um, and I'd like to end, oh, one more, one more slide. Do you all recognize this? This is Lime Lake. I actually, I wanted to say I kept doing it once I got back here, once I got back to Spring Arbor. Um, anyway, 
Final slide, this is a quote from Henry Matisse, and I just think he said it best. He was an amazing artist in his own right, but he just adored the work of Paul Cezanne, and he said, too bad for those without the strength to survive it. For my part, I never avoided the influence of others. So, that's all I've got. And now it's Brent's turn. Dr. Klein. I don't, I don't have a PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, Jen. I have this, though. Yes! So, um, so the, first of all, it's, I, I do want to sincerely thank Jen for even inviting me to do this. That's meaningful. I mean, it, I didn't ask Jen to do it. She asked me, and that, that, that means a lot. Um, Sean represents music up here. Rachel represents painting. I represent hip hop dance. <laughs> why? Why is that? Why is that funny? I don't understand. My first dance will be. Um, no, so the title of this is, is, is sort of sticking in my face, but uh, I, I'm afraid you're not going to hear me. I have really important things to say. Uh, so, of uh, uh, how, how artists go about their work, and I, I, I don't know, um, because I mean that. I, I know how I go about work. Um, so, one of the things I would want you to know is that I, I, I can't really tell you what you should be doing. Um, because I don't know what you should be doing. I'm not even sure I know what I should be doing, lest I start giving you advice about how you should be working. Because I think many of you are here because you enjoy, in some way, the creative arts. Um, but the finding of that process is part of that creative work. So I, I don't, I, I'm not Moses coming down from the mount to tell you what to do or not do. Um, even if I was, you wouldn't listen, and you'd make your precious golden calf. <laughs> And then I would get mad, and I would just say, I'm not going to dance anymore. <laughs> so... <laughs> Is it all right if I laugh at my own jokes? I hope that's, that's okay. Um, so I thought I would just go through... I, I thought I would just go through the sort of interrogatives here and just sort of apply them to myself. Um, because again, I, I'm not pretending that I can sort of advise you about what should be done. I could say maybe a few things only because I'm copying much more uh, intelligent people than myself. So I, I thought I would start with you know the, the why I do this, right? Why? And oh, I, I should say I, so I, I teach English. I, I represent writing, and it's the funny thing about writing is. You know, Sean comes up and he plays this jazz piece, and I can sit in the chair and I could really quickly say, well, I can't do that. Um, and Rachel shows slides of what she's doing, and we finally took down those Thomas Kincaid's. Maybe we'll put up Rachel's stuff instead. It's much better. Um, but there should be applause for that, because it is much better. It is absolutely much better. Um, uh, but when it comes to writing, you know, we're all fluent in English in this room. And so when it comes to writing, it's sort of like, oh, well, everybody can do that, right? Because you're fluent in, you're fluent in English. Well, you're, you're fluent in speaking. You're not fluent in writing. And one of the things, some, some of you in here have had me for creative writing, and one of the things I tell creative writing students is you better start separating speaking from writing. That you need to approach writing the way you would approach painting or music, which is obviously something that you learn and not something that you're just gifted with. It's not this subjective thing since all people are fluent in English who speak English, um, therefore all things are equal. Um, so that was just a sort of a prefatory remark. So, so why, I, why I write? Um, I, there are a lot of reasons. I don't have one good reason. I, I write because I'm curious. Um, I, I write because I, I wish I had more than one life to live. Um, Right, I'm 36, I'm still fairly young, but 
I want to do things over again, not because I regret my place that I have right now. It's a beautiful place. I am a very lucky, lucky man. But just because I, I, I want to try out different things. I want to know what would happen if I chose something else. Uh, and writing is a way of sort of exploring this, either in others' lives or in fictional lives. Um, I write because I want to solve things that I can't solve, and I don't think the writing process necessarily solves them, but it perhaps gets me, um, gets me closer to it. Um, I, I theoretically write to try and make something beautiful, but more often in my life I'm writing to try and retain something that I've already experienced, which is beautiful. Um, the, 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 the passing of beauty is a heartbreaking thing to go through uh, and, uh, and to say that it's over. And so you do this creative process to try and bring it back. And even if it's a failed process, the trying to bring it back is, is, is sort of a beatific activity, I think. Um, so that's sort of the why I do it. I mean, all, I mean, I don't think there's a bad reason for why unless you're like hate writing or something like that. Um, I don't think I hate write, uh, but I, I might want to try it now, right? <laughs> Um, what I write, well, what I write is, you know, uh, I sort of play in, in poetry and, and we do the poetry readings and whatnot and, 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 you know, the SAU theater department has been gracious enough to put on some of my, my plays, but what I'm most serious about is, is creative nonfiction. And, uh, so in terms of what I write about, it's, it's frankly what I find endlessly fascinating. Um, uh, I, I have written about um, what I consider a very holy location in this country. There's a monastery in West Virginia. Um, I've, I've written about the death of my grandfather, which happened before I was, just before I was born. I'm named after him. Um, I, I have written uh, about my daughter. Um, and my daughter, she's severely disabled, and uh, she's adopted as well, so I've written about that process. I'm currently writing something about the, the, the career arc of a child protective services worker who did it for 10 years and then has just gotten out of it because he couldn't take it anymore. Social work majors in the room, you have no idea what you're in for, right? No idea what you're in for. It's, it's, it's just sort of extremely curious to me, and so therefore I, I, I pursue these things. Um, and this is what I would tell you to do as well. Uh, I was at Kimberly Morjumanville's talk today, and she was talking about Thomas Hardy, and Thomas Hardy finally found his voice when he honestly just wrote about the things he cared about the most and not what he thought intelligent, clever people um, thought about. And, and so that's what I want to write about, and that's what I'd probably encourage you to write about as well. Um, when I write, um, I am married with three small kids. When I write is a really big deal. I know a, a professor's load doesn't mean much to you all here, but 4-4 load, which is what a Spring Arbor professor teaches, is really, really high. Um, and uh, we, I, I shouldn't say we, I can't speak for everybody, but finding time to write uh, while we teach and while we're trying to teach well, we understand that's our first job, is really difficult. And you start to have to sacrifice something. Um, don't take this out of context. I like to go to bed with my wife, uh, as in I like to go to sleep with my wife, right? Um, but I generally don't. Uh, that's when I write. Um, she says goodnight, gives me a kiss, and then I'm up for a couple more hours. And that's what I'm doing. And, uh, uh, to, you know, I'd like, those, I'd like, I'd like to, to be up there sleeping, but I, I'm not going to sacrifice my students for that, and I'm not going to sacrifice my mornings because I really love sleeping in the morning. So I, practice, I, sacrifice, my, I sacrifice my nights. Um, and that requires discipline, and I would want to echo what Sean said about the need for discipline. And what Rachel said about the, everything you need to do to knock out that loner genius that just sort of arrived as an artist, that is all false. The only place you got that from was your teenage favorite movie. That's it. You didn't get it anywhere else. Um, you have to knock it out of your head. Um, how I write? Well, there's, there's the time thing. I'm gonna take these quarters. Um, <laughs> would it be great if you just sort of watched me slowly put them in my pocket? And, like, is, should we say so? He even took the paper clip. Uh, uh, how I write, you know, I tell this to my writing students, so this is echoed uh, for some of you, but um, 
maybe it's kind of a curse, and maybe Jen can talk about this, all of you can talk about this, of like once you're in your field and you start encountering the things in your field, you start to see the man behind the curtain or the woman behind the curtain, and you're looking at how things are constructed and how things are put together. Um, you're not just sort of reading for pleasure anymore because you can't, because you just keep seeing the gears turning and the mechanism, and that's on some level a curse. But the, the beauty of it is that you actually get to see more of what's going on. I can't watch a movie, and I don't write screenplays, but I can't watch a movie and not think of when it's a, it's a love story and say, how many scenes did it take to go from hating each other to loving each other? And if it took three scenes, what did they do in those three scenes? How did that actually happen? This constant sort of breaking it down. Um, it's not magic. We professors are really good at mystifying knowledge. That way we secure our jobs. But it's not magic, right? Um, we can sort of break some of, this, break some of this stuff down. I was telling my creative writing students on uh, Tuesday, there's the scene that a lot of you know from Dead Poets Society, where they tear out the, the poetry introduction about how to analyze. What a piece of crap scene. It is, it is completely valid to, to judge poetry by breaking down its form, right? That's what we do. Of course, and we do it so that we see it more. And so how I write is also how I read. And how I read is an ethical choice as much as a creative choice. Every time you pick up a book, as far as I'm concerned, you're making an ethical choice. Um, because there's too many books to read before you die. Right? So go ahead and keep reading the stuff you should have read when you were 14 years old. Um, that's fine. But uh, at some level, you should put that stuff down and get to the things that are truly beautiful and not to the things that are just uh, distracting or entertaining. Um, I, would I would encourage you all to read masters. Um, and I would encourage you to constantly mimic masters as well. This isn't, this not, that's not creative, mimicking. Well, that's the first stage, though. Mimicking is a, is a beginning stage, and it's perfectly valid. Um, it's a perfectly valid thing to do. The last thing I'd say is, is who who I uh, write to, and I, I write to a specific few people, and those are my best friends. Everything I write is to my best friends. When I try and be funny in my pieces, which is actually not usual, I generally don't write funny things. Comedy's a lot harder, and I'm not, I'm not good enough for it. Uh, but I write to a few set of friends, and I try and be funny to them, and I try to be poignant to them. I don't try and write to the world, and I don't try to change the world with my writing. I write to these few people. I make up Twitter accounts, and I'll never tell you what they are, but I'll ma I make up Twitter accounts, and they're my followers, and I do it just to sort of entertain them, just to make them laugh, just to you know, do fun stuff with them. I don't, I'm not on Facebook, but I am, because I have like all these fake Facebook profiles that we sort of, sort of give each other, just sort of fun, creative things we do, and it's just to each other. Don't write to a, to a generic audience. If you try to make the world laugh, you will make no one laugh. Uh, it's, find the person you want to write to. I'm totally stealing this from Kurt Vonnegut, by the way. Totally stealing it from Kurt Vonnegut. Um, but know your, know your audience and write to that audience and love your audience, right? Love your audience. Um, so again, I don't pretend to, to have any kind of answers, but I wanted to give you some sort of practical, um, just one guy's uh, experience with the, with the entire writing process. So, thanks. It's really hard to follow hip hop dance. <laughs> Um, I'm assuming that most of you know me. If you don't, hi, my name is Jen, and I um, I'm one of the directors and the director of the theater program here, along with my faculty mentor Paul Patton, who's in the back, um, my dear friend and colleague Paul Patton, and my colleagues on the stage. And um, I, I'm going to talk about production. I teach uh, theater and I teach film. My MFA is in film production, and so I'm going to invite some uh, some folks from our drama orbit up, um, and they're going to help me because they're going to be presenting a live action meme. We don't just want to talk about it, we want to do it. So they're going to present a live action meme, which is a live action meme. We're coining the term now, hashtag live action meme. And um, uh, this live action meme is entitled, uh, What Actors Really Do. What our friends think we do. Wanna go to a movie? I can't, I have like rehearsal. We get dessert dinner later. I have rehearsal. Why can I go? I'm in like five the middle of a show. I'm just studying for I have the rehearsals! <laughs> what Spring Arbor thinks we do? <laughs> hey, Rumi. Yeah, no, I can't go. Wait. 
I know how I'm going to get out of everything today. I'll totally be there. One second. Hey, Prof, listen. I'm not going to be able to come to class tonight because I have rehearsal. Yes, of course. <laughs> hey, Prof, I'm not going to be able to turn in that 12-page research paper tomorrow because I have a huge rehearsal tonight. Oh, it's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> hey, boss, I'm not going to be able to work tonight. I got rehearsal. Well, be sure to find someone to cover your shit. <laughs> hey, all right. Listen, I'm not going to be able to make that mandatory floor meeting tonight because I have rehearsal. That's fine. I'll waive that $10 fee. <laughs> yeah, I'm on my way. Time to party. <laughs> what our parents think we do. My daughter's in this little show. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. Uh, so up here on the screen, uh, you can't, it's really, it's really small, but I'm going to read it as a, as a quote that is left over. It was in the syllabus for acting techniques when I inherited it from Paul Patton. I kept every one of the quotes he left there. And it says, the first discipline is the realization that there is a discipline, that all art begins and ends with a discipline, that any art is first and foremost a craft. And I think um, all the folks who've been up here tonight have talked about that. So I'm not going to dwell on it too long. I'm going to instead move to this, and hopefully, yep, yeah, it's going to go right away. And I'm just going to uh, keep that going. This is a time lapse I took last year during our eight, I, I lost count of the hours of rehearsal, 12, thank you, 12 hour rehearsal for 12th night, how ironic, which happened to be on my birthday. And so we were here in this space for 12 hours. This is a time lapse of it. And here's my question. What do you think actors do? You guys can't answer. <laughs> Brooke can answer. Several of you can't answer. You have no idea. Okay, great. Then I'll tell you. Um, we have to train. Um, actors have to train their voices because their primary instrument is their voice. If you're working in film, your primary instrument is your face. I'm not kidding. Um, and that's, that's what you use. 
Um, you have to train your body. You have to be able to, with your voice, speak with proper diction, elocution, volume, intonation, poise, etc. With your body, you need to embody the person that you are portraying. That's not just being able to dance. That's the way that you stand, your carriage, the way that you move. Um, actors have to walk correctly. Actors have to train their brain. They have to know how to mentally stay focused, how to relax and how to concentrate. We spend a lot of time on relaxation and concentration. How to think about the character and the given circumstances of the play, how to utilize techniques. They have to train their hearts. Actors have to empathize with their characters. All actors must deeply understand what it means to be a human being. Actors are always studying life and they are always studying the human condition. Um, you can't fake it. I mean, when you're up acting, you're kind of faking it always, except you have to know what you're doing. If you're not really working, an audience can always tell. Paris Hilton, can't act, can't act, she can't. <laughs> Um, what else do actors have to do? They have to memorize and interpret a script. So not just learn their lines, but figure out what they mean. They have to learn and make sense of their blocking. So it's not just, I take three steps and I sit down, but very literally, well, why do I get up and go to the window? Because why should I get up right there and go to the window? Is there any reason? How do I get there? Um, they have to rehearse and they have to make sense of the story. So they have to practice, but they also have to know that the audience has to make sense of what they're, what they're doing. They have to be concerned about that. They have to manipulate props, set pieces. They have to fit into costumes and make the costumes work even when they don't seem to work right. They have to perform and performances work. When I was directing a musical a few years ago, I was directing uh, Legally Blonde the musical and there's a lot of singing and dancing and, and the lead character in it, um, if you know Legally Blonde, either the musical or the movie, uh, which is, I mean, this, I'm gonna go from Legally Blonde to you know, Long Day's Journey to Night, which is, the, that's theater. Um, uh, Legally Blonde's lead, the, the group plays Elle Woods, in that particular show was a, a girl named Marlena, and I said, you know, she's in the middle of just really, really, and this was a musical, so it was a lot of singing and dancing and emoting, um, but, you know, she's just really up there singing and dancing, and I said, you know, what's your day job? And she said, well, I'm a, I'm a swimming instructor and a, a lifeguard. And I said, you're a swimming instructor? I said, what do you do? Do you go home every night and eat an entire box of cereal? I mean, how do you get enough carbs in your body to keep functioning all day? It's work. Being up on stage is work. It's not just physical work. It's emotional work. If you're in a play that has any kind of dramatic capacity, you're doing emotional work. Imagine if you were in a play like Long Day's Journey and Tonight, or a play like Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, or a play like August, Osage County, and you have to go through really intense emotions every night. You will go home exhausted. Performance is work. And anyone who is an introvert knows that because they knows that, that having to be your own people, having to be on display or perform, saps energy from you. For a typical show, an actor will put in, I was going to use a whiteboard, but you're just going to have to use your minds. An actor will put in uh, approximately uh, six, uh, 15 hours a week. Let's say that's, you know, five days a week, it's about three hours a day. 15 hours a week for six weeks, that's about 90 hours. Uh, text Saturday will be another eight hours if it's a good day. <laughs> Dress rehearsal, uh, five hours uh, per night, because they have to get to the theater, they have to get ready, and then there's notes afterward, times four nights is 20 hours. Performance, let's say it's a three, uh, a three performance weekend. Four hours per night for three nights is 16 hours. That's 130 hours in the theater just acting, not outside memorizing lines, not doing something else for the play, not figuring out the rest of their life. 130 hours just acting for one show, and it doesn't matter the size of their role. That's how much time is spent in the theater if you are an actor, and I'm not talking about the lighting technician who spends even more time. Most of the actors, at least, thank you, you're welcome, um, or the prop person, or the you name it, uh, the costume people, most of the actors in doing college theater, at least college theater like this, or in these uh, our small liberal arts colleges, they don't just act. They do everything else to make the production work. And so because of that, they're not just putting 120 hours or 130 hours in on the show uh, in rehearsal and performance as an actor. They're putting another 130 to 200 to 300 hours in doing everything else that the show needs. And I haven't even gotten to the stage manager, and I won't because we don't have time for that tonight. Um, so okay, so a little bit of what goes into production. 
And this is just an infographic. I'm not going to dwell on it long or talk about it. I'm talking about basically the money that went into the production of Wicked. Because we go, oh, Wicked is awesome. But if you thought about what went into that, and I'm going to slip down here now in this infographic to a uh, production of Equus. So it's not just musicals. What goes into who works on a production? We go, oh, the acting. Acting looks like so much fun. Putting on a play would be so much fun. Yeah, sure, it's fun. But guess what goes into it? And then we have things like production costs. Um, what does that one say? This is rehearsals. This is the small cost over there. And then it's uh, marketing and advertising. Uh, this one is uh, creative team freeze. I'm going to go back up here. And there were things like uh, publicity and marketing. This is, and this is just money, but know that there are people behind that. There are entire offices of people who have to work on that. A play is not just people up on a stage. The people on the stage are the minority of the people working on the play. Even if there's a cast of 50, I'm not kidding. Down here, the, the wages in theater business is also kind of an interesting thing. All right, I'm just going to take a, a, a short moment here to shout out to not just theater production, but video production. This is actually a very simple infographic of what it takes to put together a video. This is not a film. This is just a video. Um, the thing that you see, the polished thing that you see, and I don't know if any of you have ever made a video. I think there are some video people here. And you go, oh yeah, we'll just throw that video together. Lies. Lies, lies, lies. You know this is true. You know how many hours of your life you spent with the computer rendering your video footage. It is days off of your life. And that one time that you forgot to save it and it was lost and you had to reshoot the footage or had to re-edit it, it's just hours and hours and hours of work. I'm going to end with this. Um, we've been talking a lot about uh, the work that we do and what it, what it requires as far as discipline because we want to be excellent. I think that was a really great point. We want to be excellent. But I'm going to talk a little bit now as we wrap up, um, and I hope there's still time for questions, about why we do what we do. Um, and it's because there's not a person on the stage, and there's a lot of creative folks in our, our house um, as well. Uh, we do what we do because we think it's important. And it is important. In fact, it's vital. If it wasn't, with the effort it requires to make art, if it wasn't vital, we wouldn't do it. It would just be play and we would just leave it alone and we'd be, we would get tired of it and move on. But we think it is necessary. We think it's important. Why do we do what we do? This is a quote by Robert Browning. I'll let you read it on your own. Read it on your own. There was a, um, a sign up in Whiteman Gibbs, I think it was last year, which was a, it was a very good sign and I, it was not, um, I'm not trying to draw contention uh, with our, our folks uh, in the computers and sciences program because I think it was uh, worthwhile. It, it, the sign said math plus science equals jobs. And math plus science does equal jobs. Which doesn't mean that art does not equal jobs, by the way. It does not mean that. But I really wanted to respond, and it was the, it was the bad poet in me. And it wasn't a poem, but it was just like that poetic thought. Um, I really wanted to respond with, yes, but art plus music plus literature equals life. I mean, that's, that's, you know, these are about things that we need. But art is the reason we stay alive. I mean, we stay alive for grace. But yes, isn't art an expression of who God is? Isn't the, is our ability to express beauty? Isn't it come from God? Sciences may understand uh, life from a physical perspective, but we understand it from a metaphysical perspective, the perspective of story, the perspective of the human condition. I'm going to steal another quote right out of the acting syllabus I inherited from Paul Patton. We live in an extraordinarily debauched, interesting, savage world where things don't turn out evenly. It is the responsibility of the theater to remind us of this. That's David Mamet, of course. And I'm going to read you a little bit from the, tech, the textbook I use in acting techniques, which is called Great Acting Teachers and Their Methods. And this is a section on a Russian um, director. And I'm not going to talk about him really at all. I'm going to skip to what he, uh, what he was talking about. Uh, his name is Vatenga, by the way. He felt that each actor needed a reason to even come to the theater and to get on the stage. For example, you might feel that every character ever written exists as a ghost. Every character ever written exists as a ghost hovering in the spaces above the stage. You might believe that each one desperately longs to have its story told, but is incapable of doing so without help. You might feel that every character has this right to have its story told, to have its day in court, and that you are the one hope your particular character has to live again for a few brief hours. Whether a good character or an evil one, you feel the responsibility, the duty, the honor to give passionate form to this disembodied ghost. And for this reason, you will step from the wings into the playing space. 
Such an overall justification allows the actor to put herself in the service of something larger. It creates a unique bond between the actor and the character that transcends the merely personal. It gives the actor a reason for doing what she does beyond simple ego gratification. It makes the actor's work holy. For those of us who believe that telling stories makes a difference, who have been changed by stories, um, let me assure you that acting and that production, for those of you who don't already know, and I'm assuming that we have a, an audience full of people who are very sympathetic to this, that it is extremely hard work, that it is hours of our life we will never get back. We don't want them back. We believe that what we're doing is so important that we would be nowhere else except where we are, telling stories, because they believe that they change the world. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll take maybe 10 minutes or so for any of your questions. Um, but before we do, Professor Runyon asks that his writing students not stay for the Q&A and return to class immediately. Uh, thank you for coming, writing students, and Professor Runyon's class. So Q&A, does anyone have a question? I'd like to give the, you the mic so the video recording can hear you. And all of us can hear you. Any questions for any of our four panelists? Rachel, will you really hang your questions in the lobby, or hang your paintings in the lobby, please? Can you grab that mic so you can pass it yes. to the four of you? This could be answered by any of you, but what's one of the biggest challenges as an artist that you face, um, just in general? What's one of the biggest things that you face in your art? <laughs> Do I look especially challenged? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll try. <laughs> so, um, I think that for me the biggest challenge is probably actually related to what I said about community, which is just putting myself out there and accepting the fact that of course there's vulnerability in showing your own artwork, but it's worth it. Um, so, short, but that, that for me is the biggest challenge. Anybody else? I mean, I'd say the biggest challenge is just competing with the litany of angry, birding, flying, line, waving, gaming, television show, mindless entertainment options. Or, you know, just, I mean, people don't come together. I mean, that's one of the greatest things about the arts is it's real life. You know, like they say, in a symphony, if you miss an alley, you, you missed it. It's, it's not coming back. It's <laughs> or if it does, you won't know that it came back because you missed it the first time. Right. So, I mean, just the, trying to get people to actually interact in our corporal sense in the real time for which we exist, that's what I find is an increasing challenge. If one wanted to think of life as a canvas, life is black and white. It's you people, you musicians, you artists, you writers, you dramatists, that at the end of the workday, we go to a concert or an art show or read something well, well written or see a play that moves us to tears or tears of laughter. You people bring color to our black and white lives. Thank you. Can I take you home? <laughs> Stage manager. So what can Spring Arbor do to appreciate the arts more? Yeah. <laughs> show up. Yeah. Um, show up. Right? Uh, I hear about faculty whining about uh, students not going to things, and then I come to the plays, and there's no faculty there. Show up. Um, 
we, it's really easy to talk about this sort of pie in the sky, I want this kind of culture on campus. But if you're going to do that, you might have to be the one who's planting seeds of a tree whose shade you will never enjoy, right? And it's gonna be a long process. And for you students, um, right, we do sort of have an anemic um, creative uh, uh, culture on campus. And that's why the efforts of people like, like Jen and Paul are so Herculean. Um, but uh, you all need to show up and not worry about how many people are there. So you're like, eh, nobody's going, so I'm not gonna go. Um, you need to go and you need to stay after the shows and you need to congratulate those people and say thanks, not just for this performance, but for actually contributing to this much larger ethos that we need on campus. Um, you, need to, um, you, you need to mock your friends who do nothing but play video games and watch mindless entertainment. Mock them cleverly so that they love you, uh, but mock them. <laughs> Because I think when they show up to things like the poetry readings and the plays and the, and the art galleries uh, and the, uh, the, the, the concerts, I, I'm confident they're not gonna walk away thinking that that was a waste of time. They're not going to. Um, so mock them till they show up and they'll walk out satisfied. So. Oh, we had, um, yeah, you can clap for that. I've been having a continuing conversation about how to market the arts at Spring Arbor with people. And uh, you know, the, by and large, the, the biggest thing we know, and there are I think a couple of people here who are actually in Alan Knight's class, Brittany's one of them, um, that uh, people go because of word of mouth. And so uh, as much as we can, you know, we, can, uh, we can do all kinds of social media and we can do all kinds of posters, people go to things because people are going, because people they know are going. And so what, what Brent said is very true. Um, and there are, I mean, like I, I could shamelessly plug, there are what, I mean, of the, the concerts and the gallery, you know, um, uh, shows and stuff that are coming up. Of the, of the folks who came up here and worked with me, there are three seniors. Um, and one of them has a senior recital April 10th and 11th, 11th and 12th. Um, and um, Joshua, yours is May, the first weekend of May, right? Yep, third and fourth. third and fourth. And Simone, by the way, is not a drama major, she's a theology major, so she's speaking in chapel because, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and there are several other seniors and folks who are here, like here in this room. And so, there, I mean, these events are always going on. If you want to promote the arts, make it your business to know the arts and make it your business to be an art promoter. Um, uh, uh, this also, I'm going to say this, uh, how can we uh, promote the arts by, by taking part in it? One of the things I loved about college and it made me want to go back and teach at college was that there were symphony concerts and then there were also art shows and there were poetry. Like, you, I, I'm from the rural Midwest. Do you know how many of those we have in Hillsdale County? None. You know, you don't have. I'm like, I, I wasn't. I wasn't growing up going to poetry readings. I was really excited to be able to be a part of that. And you get to. You're you're around fantastic artists right now, and you should take advantage of it because when you leave, who knows how how often you'll be able to do that. So obviously, you have mentioned that there's a lot of great talent out here in, at SAU, and there's going to be more when we go out into the other world, I suppose you could call it. Um, and so when you go into the field of art and you have these people who are like the ones who are, are struggling to show that they have something beautiful that came from inside of them, and they're, they're starting to be suffocated by this world of mindless chatter, how do you encourage? What, or maybe a better question would be, what encouraged you in your process that said, yeah, this is worth it? And why was that so essential for you as an artist to hear that or experience that, besides seeing people show up, of course? Um, I'm gonna say this from a theater perspective and then I'm gonna quickly pass the mic on. Um, the saying in the theater world goes that you are bitten by the bug. And so what encouraged me, I, there, were, there were lots of encouraging people, but more than that, I couldn't not go. I, you know, once I was exposed to theater, I couldn't give it up. I'm like like every theater person. I am a theater junkie. I, I I had to go back. I was going to find it. I was going to make it if I couldn't find it. And I usually have the not very exciting answers. <laughs> <laughs> My answer is, 
I mean, I just thought about society, right? Especially in America. I mean, do we need longer lives? Not really. Do we need more food? Definitely not. Right? Do we need do we need more things? Definitely, definitely not. So I thought, what what are, what are, as Americans are we mainly missing? I picked America because that was where I was born. <laughs> and I, th I thought joy, right? Uh, the like the belief and the and, and the beauty and the gift that life is from God, right? So that was mine. And I th I thought medicine would be the next best thing, but dealing with people dying, I didn't think I was like. I think too much perfectionist, I wouldn't be able to get over it, so. If I played a wrong note, I can get over that one just fine. I, I would just, I, I, Mike, I don't know, your question about people who are doing creative things themselves? Artists, people who you want to see succeed. Oh, um, I, I don't know if I'm really answering the question, but I do feel like the making the litmus test being um, being successful is really problematic. And my encouragement would be people like you. You were marvelous in this play, and 14 people showed up. Why? Why is that not a good measurement of your success? You you, you created beauty. Um, you you did uh, you read this poem, and the poetry reading is over, and it's gone. But it was a moment of beauty. And so I think most of our interaction with artists are people like Kanye West, or people who are national and international stars. So the only way we can be encouraged is to be a national or international star, instead of just creating something which is true or good or beautiful. And if you created it and you participated in that, um, convincing people that that is the real goal and not some sort of vainglorious attempt at um, fame. Um, so I read an uh, article on motivation recently, and one of the things that really struck me is it said, you don't need to feel like doing something to do something. And I'm just wondering how that statement can apply when practicing the art, when you don't feel particularly driven, you know, you don't have all the feels um, that re is required to, you know, bust out a really great uh, piece of writing or music. Or uh, So how do you guys uh, work with that? How do you do something even when you don't feel like it. Um, I walked into work one morning and I had a conversation with Paul Patton. How many people get to say that? <laughs> I get to say that. And, and uh, what Paul said was he was talking about some writing he was doing, you know, and it was just, it was, it was, it was, it was not a, a day where it came easy. And what he said was, ah, that's why they call it work. And that struck me as the embodiment of that that I couldn't expect it to always be fun, no, no matter what I was doing. And in the middle of a 12-hour rehearsal, I can't think about it being fun. I can only think about it being right. Because in the middle of, you know, Sean's playing, um, he's not thinking about, boy, this is super fun. He's thinking about, no, I, I need to fix that. I need to go back and work on that. It's not yet excellent. And it's not just being a perfectionist, it is, it is the idea that we, we're supposed to make something, if we're going to make something at all, we need to make something excellent. We serve an excellent God. Um, uh, Flannery O'Connor said, um, when she was asked, can you be both a Catholic and an artist? She said, I think because I'm a Catholic, I cannot afford to be anything less than an artist. And I think that says something about how there is a drive to, to make something excellent because we serve an excellent God. And, and that's, you, you stop thinking about how you feel, you only think about what it is that you're doing and, and how you make it right, I guess is what I would say. Um, this story is, is very foreign to many of your all's experience, but um, I, you know, I, I, because of my church tradition, I'm, I was at a time where I was speaking with a monk and, and talking about what my prayer rule should be, and a prayer rule is given to you. Um, you do not create a prayer rule yourself, and so the monk is providing me this prayer rule, and and you know, I'm talking about how pitiful my, my prayer life is. And so he gives me this prayer rule, and it's really pathetic. And it sort of offends my sensibilities. Like, I can pray more than, than this a day. But he says, no, 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 no. You need to do something small every single day. 
right? I don't want to give you this large prayer rule that only two days out of the week you're going to accomplish because prayer is a spiritual discipline. And so you go and you pray at this time whether you feel like it or not because it's a discipline. And, and that's how I would approach the creative work as well, which is you take your egg timer or your stopwatch and at the same time, to the best of your ability, you give yourself a day off or something, but to the best of your ability, at the same time every day, you start that egg timer and you write. And your emotion or the creative muse or whatever lie you're using is not what's pushing you, but just that act of discipline. Just like what was going to drive me to prayer is discipline and not feeling like I want to communicate with God. Because the times when I need to communicate with God are the times when I do not want to communicate with God. And the times that I need to be writing are the very times that I am not writing. So if you allow emotion to be your engine, um, you, you are never getting out of the station. Maybe, uh, maybe I have time for one more question. Um, first, I'd just like to thank you guys for being willing to um, like share your hearts and be vulnerable because that's really not a small thing, and I think we make it out to be sometimes. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak on that because you can't create art like without giving of yourself and presenting your heart to people, and that's really scary. Um, so could you talk about vulnerability and why it's important and why it's like worth it, I guess? Uh, well, that connects with what I was saying earlier. I mean, I heard someone describe making art as being a little bit like sending out a message in a bottle once, um, which sounds really bleak <laughs> because nobody's probably going to find it. <laughs> um, but, and I, I do think sometimes, you know, that's where maybe the, the feeling of, um, the, uh, the, not, not the reality that the artist is isolated, but the, the feeling that the artist is isolated comes in because you have this thing that's so deep and that you want to express and it is vulnerable and you're sort of sending it out into this world with this hope that it connects with someone, that it means something to someone, that somebody sees it the way you do. Um, so I think that the reason that I've had the courage to do it partly is because I've had some incredibly generous people who've told me that there, my work meant something to them and sometimes not even what I'd imagined it might mean but if it, w if it was significant to them or if it helped them um, then that was part of what pushed me past feeling like oh it's all about me and it's so hard to share so um, others? Uh, they'll, they'll have other response but like just so you know um, we're not worshiping idols though. You are not your art. You're not your art. And so pouring yourself into your art, you better be careful that you don't start to fetishize art. And that's not just when rejection comes and you feel like you are being rejected, but the reason we do art is to draw closer to the divine and to draw closer to other people. And so we can't fetishize art and make art actually be the end. We're Christians up here, so art is helping us be more divine. Art is helping us um, have compassion, to share the passion, to share the suffering. That's what art does. And as soon as art becomes like this thing that I am pouring myself into and nothing else, it's just that golden calf. So those are easy words to say. And when rejections come, it does feel like you're being rejected. But, but just have a voice in your head somewhere. You are not your art. Right? You are not your art. You're bigger than that. And the person who is reading it or seeing it or hearing it is bigger than that as well. I mean, I just, I mean, kind of along that line, I mean, the reason why you're making art, at least from my standpoint, is, is to show, like, the glorious parts about life, right? So, I mean, it's not so much about me being vulnerable. It's about me saying, hey, this, this place here? I mean, while it's not perfect, right? We're falling. But it's making it a little bit better. And, you know, life still is a great gift, right? You know, the good news. And just trying to share that with other people. I mean, especially in today's society, I mean, people aren't running around going, oh, this is great. This is great. They're walking around like this. Oh, I've got too much stuff to do. I can't do anything. So, well, but, but, but that's, I mean, that's true. Like, I mean, just look around. Even, even on Spring Arbor's campus, right? An evangelical Christian university. Watch people walk around. They're not usually going... 
Like the other day I saw a student go like this. And I thought, oh wow, look at that rejoicing. And I said, are you having a great day? No, they said, no, I give up. I'm like, no. <laughs> But, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's just keeping it in perspective, right? Because, you, you know, I mean, you have great worth as a human being created by God in the image of God, right? So as long as you have that grounding, it's not really, I mean, you are great because you were made by a great creator. And then you're just trying to do the best you can. And that's all I have. Um... Being a fairly performative person and having a you know performative personality, I realized only in my 30s did I realize that I was constantly, after I did anything, seeking approval from people. That I wanted to know that I did it well, and it could be as much as like you know, did I do the dishes well as a kid, right? You know that I was, and so in that sense, um, I, I understand the vulnerability. I want I wanted to do this well, um, and have had, and this is, uh, have had people who like Rachel. I can say these people encouraged me, and that that was really helpful. But I think that there's a lot of wisdom and what uh, you know, and what the guys have said as well, because. As an artist, I don't feel vulnerable anymore. I mean, you know, I, I guess I do, but I don't. Sure, if you didn't like the play, I'm sorry that you didn't like it, but it's not, I'm not, you know, I'm not, we're not talking about, it, we worked at that. I want it to be excellent, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not going to apologize for somebody's reaction to it. Do you get what I mean by that? And so I don't, um, it, what, and even if, even if the play stunk, even if it was a bomb, um, I'm still beloved of Christ. I am still a complete and whole person. And um, the, the Mother Teresa quote is, the, is, is God did not call us to be successful, God called us to be faithful. And that's part of that idea of art being a discipline as well. Uh, I'm not always gonna be successful, especially if I'm a creative person. Sometimes I'm gonna have to try something and boy, that's not, not gonna work. Nope, didn't work that, nope, that one just did not work at all. Um, but uh, I'm going to be faithful at it. I'm going to faithfully try to um, um, tell the truth, and I'm going to faithfully try to um, uh, uh, say something redemptive, and I'm going to faithfully try to embody something beautiful that was created by God. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned about it being faithful than I am about it being successful. And so as much as, yeah, I, I, we feel vulnerable as artists, as an artist, maybe, but as a person, no. I'm a person in, in you know, in a state of grace. And so, um, as, I'm, I'm kind of vulnerable, but I'm not. I'm under the blood of Christ. And so I, I don't need society's approval, and I don't really need the approval of, you know, of anyone. I, I want feedback. I want to know how I can get better. I want to know how faithfully it was served. I want to be excellent, but it's not my personal worth. Just like, this, I, I had this conversation, who was it, with Dory, somebody? It might have been Becky Bite, uh, where you know the, the I'll have students who will apologize to me um, for not doing an assignment, and I'll say you know you, I, I'm not taking it personally. You're just going to get a bad grade. You know this is not you know this is not it's not my grades are not personal. Oh well, A for you, B. You know it's and it's not like that. It's you do the work, you get the grade, and so it's uh, it's not a personal thing as much as it is, and it's certainly put your art into your, your art into your heart into your art. Wow, that's late. <laughs> um, blah, blah. I, I speak for a living. Uh, it's, you pour your art into your heart, but, um, but, but who you are is not vulnerable. Who you are is, is, is who you are in Christ. That's not, an audience never changes that. An audience can't, not if you truly are a son of, or a daughter of Christ. Does that answer your question? All right, well, thank you very much. Let's give our panelists a uh, final round of applause.